You got the call. Welcome to the Big Leagues, kid. going on everybody welcome back to the call up presented by triple play fantasy we've got a packed show tonight filled with so many prospects my head can't even wrap around everything we're going to get to tonight it's an absolute treat who our guest is tonight as well if you're watching on youtube you guys can already see it if you're on the podcast version i'm going to keep you in suspense just a little bit longer to make it a little bit sweeter first mike Vinny, how are you guys doing today it was it was unreal i'm doing great guys uh like you said, usually I, I tend to spoil the guests, so I'll, I'll let it slide this time. Uh, how's it going, Vinny? I'm doing good, you know. Allergies are killing me today. You know, I've gotten out to see a lot of draft prospects for this upcoming draft this past week. You know, just getting ready for the draft, keeping up with prospects. You know, Same old, same old. Same old we like to hear, for sure. And our guest this week, he's the man with the voice heard around the world because you can catch him on in this league and prospect one you can catch him on fantasy pros you can catch him on the athletic you can catch him rates and barrels you can catch him on fpd pod the fantasy baseball today podcast oh my man is everywhere today and we are happy to have him with us today it is the welsh aka chris welsh how's it going man What's up, guys? Today I'm here. Today I'm here. I can call. Yes, a lot of places. I'm very glad to be here talking prospects with all of you fine gentlemen. How are we doing? We're good, man. We're good. We're pumped to have you. Again, I, I'm sure I've used this reference before, but again, you are like on the Mount Rushmore prospect analyst in the fantasy baseball space. So anytime we can get one of the founding fathers, if you will, on the show where there's a lot of people watching and want to get the inside scoop on who they should look at in their dynasty leagues and players they should just keep an eye on if they just enjoy the game of baseball. Uh, again, you and these two here are, are the people to do it. And so I'm super pumped to have you here. Please, uh, before we get started, though, Welsh, you got all, all these things going on in your life right now with all these fantasy baseball podcasts, you know, editing, writing show sheets. Uh, it's a crazy world. Do you ever find yourself like you're just overwhelmed sometimes with all the different places and things going on? Every single day, <laughs> every single day, a hundred percent, my friend. Yeah, no, it's it, it's more of a grind. It, it actually, we're coming up on almost a year ago to the date. Within a couple of days, I lost my my job that I had had for fifteen years in radio, and that kind of like altered uh, this, you know, my whole space. And lucky, luckily enough, it was kind of like a crossroads of like what's going to happen. I've been able to maintain the thing that I want, kind of the dream uh, with with a lot of these great places with, you know, fantasy pros is probably, you know, the biggest, most important of all of them that is kind of stuck with. And and then it was a slow, just kind of addition. CBS had me coming on and with Frank Stanfall and then The Athletic has grown. All of these have been really great. I love all of them. I love doing all of them. But when you've got your hand, I also do, you know, show on sports grid. So I've got a lot mm -hmm. of, stuff. so when you've got all these things going on, it is a like time management. Holy crap. <laughs> am I doing everything right? Uh, every single moment. And on top of it, I'm also, I love my prospects and I'm mm -hmm. doing more baseball coverage than ever. I've got to make sure I'm going out and I'm watching games and stuff like that. So yes, as fun as it all is, it is stressful every single day until, you know, and probably until I hone down a little bit and I got someone that uh, takes me on full time and it's in this league and one of those fine establishments. But yes, you guys know, you know, the grind, you know how it goes. Well, when and not if that happens, we, I think, are going to do some type of party. I don't we go on a stream, have a little drinks, watch some baseball, do something. We're going streaking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We'll do something to celebrate because, again, it's coming. And in the meantime, uh, we're happy to have you on the show tonight just to break down some of these awesome prospects. For those that watch every single week, you guys know how we do. We go in and we dive into the players of the week, players that caught our eye and doing big things right now in the minor leagues. And, oh, man, this, this might be the cover boy of all of minor league baseball right now. Ellie De La Cruz, our first gentleman on the slate tonight. 
Uh, you guys know him. He's an infield prospect for the Cincinnati Reds, 21 years of age in AAA right now. He's got six home runs, 16 RBIs, K rate under 30%. We'd like to see that drop a little bit more, but still very manageable for his skill set. 8% walk rate here. Well, we are starting here pretty hot with one of the hottest guys in the minor leagues. Obviously, there's so many things to like about this kid. Uh, talk to us a little bit about him. Yeah, I mean, Ellie has taken really every challenge and not only accepted it, but uh, bested it at this point. And we're not in a place of like, oh, you know, like Ellie, what, what more does he have to do? It's just he has to get called up. That's where we're at right now. He is dominating. He has hits in 10 of his last 11 games, which is absurd. Um, famously, a couple nights ago, if anyone had been paying attention to this, and I think I mistook it. I thought it was three homers, but I believe this was on May 9th, where he had three hits, two homers, and another hit, all 116 miles an hour <laughs> higher which is absurd it is crazy talk to think not that's not his season total that was in one single game three hits of 116 or more um ellie in that same period of time over those 10 games has five games that are multi-hit games and these are the type of things you've been waiting to see and you know i've seen ellie in a couple different spots being out here in arizona and I recall him being the very tall, lanky, very own. And I've, I've said this thing a lot. So people have heard it if they've ever listened to me. Is like he was a tall, lanky, O'Neill Cruz looking mm -hmm. type of body. It changed this year. He, it is not that same. And he's a tall, lanky guy. So the, the comp is like pretty easy. But he's got he's got the shoulders. You can see just in the upper body that the graphic you had up. You can see in the upper body. Oh, look, there's that shoulder width. That's going to be able to pack on more muscle. And you don't really necessarily see that with O'Neill Cruz. And he looks big. Like he added a lot of muscle. And, you know, his strikeouts are a problem. That's something that's going to have to come down over time. But this isn't, that's not the type of thing that's going to take him away. Uh, 278 in AAA, coming off of a 305 in AA, a solid strikeout numbers have dropped a little bit. He's not stealing at the same clip, which I just don't think is the thing. But listen here. Ellie De La Cruz is easily arguable as the top prospect in baseball right now. And that is up for debate for a lot of people because mm -hmm. Jordan Walker became the default guy. Um, I think some could be disenchanted with what's happened and maybe move him off. But I, I, I say, let's not do that for a second. Let's assume Jordan Walker is still number one. You've now got a grouping of baseball. America says Jackson Churio. Some I have moved uh, Jackson Holiday up to my number three overall prospect. Mm. What he's doing, and then Ellie belongs in there. So if you want to make an argument that Ellie belongs over both the Churio and Holiday, I think you can easily do that because he'll play third base. That's what he's doing in AAA. It's a good premium position. It's elite power. He can run if he wants. And guess what? He is like weeks or days away from coming up to the majors. And I think this oh. hot streak has all but kind of solidified that. And I speculated on fantasy pros today, uh, Mindy, that, you know, with TJ Friedel going down easily, what this team could do is they can move Nick Senzel back into the outfield because that spot is not for Nick Senzel in the future. That Spot is Ellie De La Cruz's. I still think CES Christian Encarnacion strands, the first one up, he plays third, but this year, you will have a game. I'm telling you right now. Think about this moment when it comes here. Christian Encarnacion Strand will be at first. Jonathan mm -hmm. Indy at second. Matt McLean is at short. And Ellie De La Cruz is at third. That lineup will happen this year at some point. So that's what the future is. So Ellie could jump CES if they want to just stick to the positions. All of this to say is like the best and the hitter of the week has easily been Ellie De La Cruz. That's a pretty insane thought or like in a good way, like to think about just to have CES and Ellie De La Cruz at the corners of the infield and then having India and um, I'm sorry, who was, was that? Matt McLean. Matt, Matt McLean, McLean at shortstop. He's been nuts. Like to have that, those four in the infield together, uh, it just seems nuts to me. Like it, it's such a t young, well, talented team with, with the fact that you also, Nick, I still believe in Nick Lodolo and Hunter Green. And Graham Ashcraft maybe was a little over his head, but he's still a, a very serviceable start. Like they're building a great young team. And let me blow that. your mind here for a second as well. Not only do they have um, all those guys, Andrew Abbott is another yep. player who's going to be up very soon. Insane K numbers, but 
All of that infield we talked about does not include Noel V. Marte, who Noel V. Marte has picked that back up. And that's what's going to be. So here's what the future looks like for that team. This is where I think things are going to adjust. If they were to, let's just say, move off of India, I think Matt McClain would slide to second. Ellie goes back to short because Noel V. Marte is a third baseman. He is nothing more than a third baseman. He will not play short. He'll either, at the, if that lineup st- uh, was staying, maybe they would try him on a corner outfield or DHing but he's not a shortstop and that won't happen. And he has been playing third. So they've got a glut of riches and mm-hmm. we just need that prospect wave to start hitting. And it's going to happen like really, really soon. I think CEA, I, I, I just think this Friedel injury is going to bring one of these guys up. And I would have said nine out of 10 times it was uh, CES, but I think Ellie has made a crazy case as of recent, especially for his position. He's been rising up through the minor league so quickly. And I think it was even be- before the last minor league season started a, a year ago, he wasn't even that big. And then he just blew up last year. And then now it's obviously he's he's like the face of minor league baseball. And I can't wait to see him in the big leagues. Uh, this next player, Jose Ramos of the Los Angeles Dodgers. He right now is in double A for them. He's got over the past week, 24 plate appearances. He's got a 333 batting average, three home runs, five ribbies. And on the season, a very respectable 280 batting average, eight home runs, four stolen bases, with 139 WRC plus here, Vinny, uh, Dodgers have a lot of prospects of that are very notable to even the very casual uh, minor league guy like myself. But this is not one of the names I think people see too often. So can you tell us a little bit about Jose Ramos? Yeah, Ramos blew up back in 21 during the complex league. He was showing a good blend of uh, good contact and good power. Uh, as he progressed through the minors, the average really took a hit high K's, but the one thing that has been constant with him is the ability to absolutely destroy baseballs. Like we're talking about this kid last year at high A had 25 home runs. There's, he could easily have 25 home runs this year in double A. Like if we're talking about the Dodgers organization and uh, just a player that possesses double plus power, I think there's only two names that you can guarantee that. And that's Andy Pejas and then Jose Ramos. Like if you look at uh, the Dodgers top 30 lists, like around the industry, you're going to see Ramos is towards the bottom just because we have, it's been a while since we've seen him put up a consistent good average and have a, you know, a K percentage under 30%. This year he saw, he's putting it all together at double a, and this is a scary name to watch because if he really gets hot, I don't see them being very uh, like, I don't see them keeping him there at double a, if he gets hot, I could easily see them being aggressive and pushing him to triple a like he's big bodied outfielder. He's probably an average defender with, uh, with an average arm, maybe an above average arm. But if we're talking about the Dodgers need help and look at what James Outman has done this year for them, like I could easily see him following a track if he keeps on producing with this type of numbers and low K rate. It's really interesting too. Uh, just reading up, he was five foot eleven, one hundred and fifty pounds when he signed at seventeen years old, and then he added fifty pounds uh, over the last five years. So he's really filled into his body, and obviously the power is now coming just uh, as he's been bulking up a little bit here. And he seems like he's got a, a very nice skill set here that could fit well in the big leagues. Again, twenty five percent K rate in Double A is very respectable. He's walking almost nine percent of the time, and um, Vinny, do you think this is a guy that could sniff the major leagues this year, like as a September call-up, or is he a 2024 type of look? I would say he's a 2024 type of look because we I, we need to see the numbers stay good for a long period of time. But, yeah, he was okay at the World Baseball Classic for Panama. Like, there is hype around him. We've seen him show up in, like, big, big games already so far in his career, but – Like, if we're talking the Dodgers need an outfielder next year, there's no way that Jose Ramos is not on the radar. All right, I'm excited to see Jose Ramos, as well as this next player here, Henry Davis, who Pittsburgh, they have have a glut of riches in their own right uh, with some of the players they've drafted over the recent years at the top of the draft. He's a catching prospect for Pittsburgh, although I do believe he can play a couple different positions, if I'm not mistaken. Um, he's in double a right now and just over a hundred plate appearances this season. He's got a 300 batting average and a 446 OBP 
eight home runs, even gives you five steals from the catcher position. The number that stands out to me is the 375 ISO, uh, along with a K rate that's under 20%, both uh, monstrous marks there and the 15.8% walk rate to boot here, uh, Mike. Henry Davis, I know Pittsburgh has kind of a log jam at the catcher position. Um, is that why they're thinking of potentially moving him off to first base? Yeah, you said a lot of great things there. You know, Henry Davis kind of struggled last year because of injuries when I looked into it. He only played about half the games and his stock took a hit. But this was the number one overall pick out of Louisville in 2021. Right now he's listed as a below average hit tool, which I think is a little too harsh. He hasn't shown the kind of strikeout concerns that would give mm -hmm. make me think he has a below average hit tool. He has plus game power and double plus raw power, which is going to stand out at the catcher position in the major leagues. Like that will be a carrying tool. Obviously, he doesn't have any speed. That's not going to be a big part of his game. I'm actually surprised by the five steals. He's listed as 30-grade 30, 30 speed. So, uh, he, like you said, he's having a huge bounce-back season. The injuries limited him last year. Uh, Andy Rodriguez ended up surpassing him on the mm -hmm. organizational depth chart. But he should be able to work his way into the lineup. At th The key is going to be whether he stays at catcher. Like you said, he doesn't profile as a great defensive player at the moment. Probably below average defensively. But if they could kind of split time with him and Andy Rodriguez and play him at first base. Also, he could also DH. I think they're going to work his way in. They're going to try to work Henry Davis into the lineup. You know, they, they use the number one overall pick on him. They still have really high hopes for him. I think this is a good buy opportunity because we're, he's obviously shown he's been productive. If you, if you kind of give him a pass last year, like, you know, cause considering the injuries and his pedigree, like I'm basically willing to give him a mulligan, especially with how weak the catcher position is overall. I'm not as excited about him if he ends up becoming a first base DH guy mm -hmm. only, but if he maintains catcher eligibility, I, I think he's definitely going to be a mainstay in fantasy lineup. So um, yeah, I mean, I'm high on Henry Davis. He's having a huge bounce back season and I think he's probably close to the major leagues too, because they moved him through three levels last year during an injury plague season. So I'm actually Phil, Phil, or not Philadelphia, but uh, Pittsburgh kind of slow plays their prospects, at least, especially recently but they're kind of starting to build towards a contention window. So I, I think they're going to bring him up as soon as they think he's ready. One side note to add to him is they just played him in right field uh, two nights ago, I think it was. So not just the first base, they're looking for flexibility. That's usually a very early sign of we've got to get this guy up here and we've got to see what what flexibility do we have at the major league roster? So um, I think that's a good sign for him to come up. And not only the three levels he played in the A, both these guys, Jose Ramos and Henry Davis played in the uh, Arizona Fall League last year. So saw a bunch of both of them. Yeah, with Henry Davis, even with talking about him and Andy Rodriguez, Andy Rodriguez has spent time in second and outfield this year as well. So it's kind of cool that the Pirates are having them move around a little bit just to keep both bats in the lineup and be able to have the flexibility. So uh, very exciting uh, group of players coming up in Pittsburgh. Vinny, a Chicago Cub is referenced on this show, but this time it's not from you here. Uh, this one is from Welsh as Ben Brown right now, split time between double A and triple A so far in 2023. He started six games, pitched just over 30 innings, has 47 strikeouts, a 0.59 ERA. Even the XFIP at 258 is very respectable. That K rate nearly 40%. Uh, ben Brown, man, uh, the Cubs could use some pitching. Ben Brown maybe could be the uh, medicine that they're craving right now because he's looking really good. Yeah, he's put up some video game like numbers. He's a big body pitcher, six foot six on the mound. He's got a big fastball that's got some ride on it, a uh, big power curveball slider. I mean, it's the big three pitches he comes at you with. Uh, and that curveball really could be a good strikeout pitch because that fastball, unlike, you know, like Brandon Fott, who I was a big guy on, this is like a big fastball that's going to set up the secondaries better. And he's put up video games, video game like numbers. So if you want to look at like who is a pitcher of the week, over his last start since May 4th, Ben Brown was moved from double A up to triple A. And those two starts have been in triple A since May 4th. He's had two 17 strikeouts, just over 10 innings. He's only given up five hits in triple A, 
been a little bit of walk heavy, and that was his problem early on. It was command. How well was he going to be able to command? So far, so good. I know they're going to want the walks to taper down a little bit. The strikeout numbers are there. Uh, the stuff looks like it has been ticked up even more because, I mean, ridiculous .59 ERA. I mean, the guy's just not getting hit. He has two of his six starts where he's given up an earned run, and he's given up one homer in all of his starts. Five of his six, he's gone over five. He struck out six plus in every single start, and he struck out seven plus in uh, five of those six. It's been big. It's been big stuff. You're going to get an opportunity. I'd also say guys like Marcus Stroman have really found some success in sweepers, so it'll be interesting to see how the team maybe alters with him. But Ben Brown, he's been good. He's probably one of the best pitchers over the last week or so. And he's on a, you know, he's on a pretty good trajectory to be up at the major. Some point I would say probably next month. I mean, I, I don't even know how to guess anymore on these guys. You don't think a guy's going to come up for two months and then he's called up tomorrow. So don't put anything past, but Ben Brown, I think outside of command has probably answered every question the Cubs want in his move up to triple A. So it's only a matter of time before he hits up the majors and he's a lower named guy. That isn't on a lot of high end prospect lists. And at the end of the day, it might not stick there. You know, it is crazy numbers and he's going to have to continue to succeed. Command has been a big major problem and that might fall apart. You know, you're still walking two, three, four at triple a, it's going to be something to monitor when you get to the majors, but uh, he's got an opportunity to be one of those big high rising pitching prospects simply because of this year's success and it translating to the majors. So keep an eye on him and, you know, he might not even, it might not even be a conversation about like, Oh, Hey, he's a top 100 guy. He might just be graduated from this list with the time that he could in theory get with the Cubs in the near future. Well, do you have like his ceiling in terms of, is he a, a number two starter in best case scenario? Is he just like a back end arm, but just, you know, kind of like a, I'm picturing like a, a Nathan Evaldi type of, for your, your fantasy rotation in terms of you could have him as your SP four or five. It, what is his ceiling to you? I mean, this year I, it's probably something like, like you said, like an SP five SP six, it's, it's more on the back end of the bench. He might even be just a streamer. It's probably more likely if we're being honest with ourselves, probably more likely to be more of a streamer this year. Long-term, I think on his own team, I mean, if everything worked out, Ben Brown could in theory, just be an ace. You know, you got mm -hmm. a big fastball like that with a curve and slider who gets big strikeouts. If you cut down the walks, Sure, you could be a you know a number two pitcher for the Cubs, but I, I think realistically, I think there's going to be some bumps and bruises along the way. We've got to see how this new pitch mix works overall. But you know, like I said, he's a huge hot name right now, in, especially in the lower named market of pitching. You know, one of the guys I was going to talk about was Gavin Williams. That's like maybe one of the best pitchers in all of baseball. Ben Brown doesn't sit in that area, so there's probably a lot of leagues he might just still be floating around for people, and he's probably someone you should speculate on. How about the Cubs, man? The Cubs' last trade deadline, they trade Scott F. Ross to get Hayden Wisniewski, and then they trade David Robertson to get Ben Brown. That's that's a pretty pretty good trade deadline for the Cubs. Getting been two doing well, yeah, two good young pitching prospects brought in here. Uh, next player here, sticking with the Chicago Cubs theme here, Vinny Jackson Ferris, left-handed pitcher in the Chicago Cubs system. Right now, it's single A. He's only 18 years of age. Three innings on the season, so very small sample size, but seven strikeouts there. Obviously, we're digging really deep here with Mr. Ferris. So obviously, many people may not have seen his name or not heard anything about him. So tell us a little bit about Jackson Ferris. Yeah, Ferris coming into 2022 before the draft, all the hype was, the big discussion was, is Dylan Lesko the best high school pitcher in the draft or is it Jackson Ferris? Shortly after that, Lesko had to get Tommy John, and then Ferris was inconsistent at all the events. So he tumbled down boards. It looked like he was going to sign with uh, – he was going to commit to his college commitment. Cubs ended up taking him uh, later and giving him a big lump sum. But we're talking about a left-handed pitcher here who is, you know, 18 years old that oozes projection. Like right now, we're, he is 6'4", 195. Uh, so – Relatively, by the time you know he hits double A, he'll probably be somewhere around you know six four two ten two you know two fifteen. But watching his start last week in low A against Frank Mazzucato, who is one of the best pitchers this year in you know below double A, I was absolutely blown away with what this kid can do. Like 
he has easily three plus pitches, which is a fastball, a changeup, and a curveball. But how he locates and dots his fastball and then sets sets up his curve and change is he almost it's almost like he pitches like a college pitcher. Because watching comparing him to the night before Cade Horton pitched before him, they are very similar in how they I don't know if it's an organizational thing, but it's very similar how they set up their off-speed pitches. Like he was hitting 96, like corner dot and painting people, like just absolutely leaving them baffled for a absolute hammer curve. Like if we're talking about a pitcher that is relatively under the radar in dynasty, like I could easily see Ferris being by the end of this year, have some kind of early Kyle Harrison type of hype. Like, Oh man. Like the, the absolute, like his arsenal and how he pitches and how he thinks on the mound is absolutely astonishing for a kid that hasn't really played above, you know, high school baseball. Like he is like the pitcher I'm going to target right now to get in before the hype is crazy is probably Jackson Ferris. Like there's that so the one that's on your Twitter account. I know you have a, you're a stand of somebody on your Twitter. account. Uh, that's Jefferson Cuero. That's, that's a different discussion for another day, <laughs> but yeah, just, it is absolutely crazy how the Cubs are now developing pitching that all these kids now coming out, like you don't know. And then when they come to the show, it's just their repertoire is more advanced than what they were. Like Ferris, go get Ferris. Cause I'm telling you by the end of the season this year, he's going to be one of the hottest sub double a pitching names in dynasty baseball. The time traveler has spoken. Jackson Ferris is the guy that you need to go get. Uh, so make sure you keep an eye on Jackson Ferris. There are a few pitching prospects out there that make my heart flutter a little bit. And the list is, is probably four or five guys. And Gavin Williams is on that list. And right now in triple a, uh, as he got the promotion during this season, 30.1 innings, 0.89 ERA, which is just utterly ridiculous, 36.9% K rate. Uh, Gavin Williams will be up with the Guardians this year, and I'm speculating that he'll be one of those, when he gets the call, he'll be one of those high fab guys that's going in leagues. Uh, but again, Mike, Gavin Williams is a stone-cold stud. Uh, just tell us a little bit about the pitcher, and then also tell us, at the big leagues this year, what kind of impact you think he could do? Yeah, I actually think this is the first time I've had a chance to talk about Gavin Williams. Oddly enough, uh, just looking at his overall profile, like you said, he's a six foot six, two hundred and fifty pound, twenty three year old who's dominating AAA. He's having a very similar season to Ben Brown. Actually, I just do want to throw that in. If Ben Brown continues doing what he was doing, he's going to really rise up lists. But Gavin Williams selected twenty first overall in two thousand twenty one a power arm with an upper 90s fastball and three above average to plus secondary pitches, you know, plus fastball, plus slider, above average curveball, fringe average changeup with average command. Uh, he's been productive throughout his minor league career, probably the most upside of any arm in the Guardians, and that includes the major leaguers. I do think he's could be their number one if everything clicks. The key for him, in my opinion, is just throwing strikes and staying healthy. He does have some health concerns in the past, but this is a frontline starter upside who could be a mainstay in fantasy rotations. Like I said, if he throws enough strikes and stays healthy, every other aspect of his game is exactly what I want to see from a pitcher, the size, the stuff, the organization. Um, basically, I would, I, I'm with you. He's one of my top five pitching prospects. I think he's going to come up this year. I'm not exactly sure when, but I do like him more long-term than Tanner Bybee and mm -hmm. Logan Allen. I think he's going to, if he's given a chance to take over a spot and stay in the rotation, I think he's going to be a huge fab bid this year. Mm -hmm. And and next year when he's in the rotation, probably, I think he's going to be even a mid early mid round pick and redraft. I think this is a guy people are really high on. It's kind of going to get up in that level with like Nick Lodolo and Hunter Green and just really high upside guys that people are, are really high on and want to be part of their teams long term. Dare I say, Welsh, that it might be smart of me in my fab leagues to put a dollar on him right now and be a, maybe a week or two ahead of when everybody's throwing $250 on him. Yeah, um, 
it's funny when you're saying like everyone's gonna spend all the money. No one's gonna have money left. There's gonna be <laughs> no true. money to be left at all for anybody. We're we're recording. You know, when we're doing this, Yuri Perez is pitching. Yuri Perez is gonna go for an uh, as long as the start isn't an implosion. Yeah. Yuri Perez is going to break everybody's money. I don't know what money people have left. I mean, Bryce Miller a week ago went for like 300 in a lot of NFBC leagues. You're if, if the money is there, Yuri Perez will break that. So what's going to be left for these guys? I don't know how long you can sit. And like I said, like I'm torn because I just don't even know how to project a lot of this stuff anymore. Cause teams are doing things that it's hard to like, it's, it's hard to piece, like see the map of the road. It's like, CES should have been up like a month ago. You know, Ellie should have been up like a month ago. Y- Yuri Perez and, and Bryce Miller are at double A. Like this is breaking the mold of what we know as far as like predictability. So anything's possible. I look at the Guardians and I go, how? Like, what are they going to do? Are they really willing to have a rotation that's like four rookies or five, you know, or three rookies in the rotation? If Gavin Williams comes up, it means they are done theoretically, I suppose, with Aaron Savali, because Aaron Savali is going to come up and he'll take over that Peyton Battenfield spot and Peyton Battenfield will go away. So it's like when they when Gavin Williams comes up, it will be at the expense of either Logan Allen, Tanner Bybee or Aaron Savali. And I just don't know if they're going to feel incentivized with all the guys they've already pushed up, not to say Gavin Williams doesn't deserve this. So I tend to be a little bit more pessimistic to say that, like, Gavin Williams is probably more of like a post futures game type of play and let him marinate a little bit and push him up. What the hell do I know? You know, I mean, these guys are going like crazy right now. Um, so if you want and you've got, especially dude, if you have an in a, in a spot, like you can put minor leaguers on another roster spot. I think he might be one of the best bets to get right now and stash him. But there's a lot of places you have to, you know, you have to put him on your bench and that kind of stinks. And it might be, it mm-hmm. could be two months. I mean, it could be two days, but it could be two months. Who would you rather stash right now, Lance McCullers or Gavin Williams? Ooh, um, I don't like Lance McCullers. I'm not. I it, unfortunately, it's probably Lance McCullers because I think he's got a better path of getting up in the Astros. If you're talking like redraft, uh, it, anything long term, it's all about Gavin Williams. I mean, Ga- Gavin Williams legit might be the. No- I, I think Jeff Ponce might have him as the number one pitching prospect in baseball already. So it's like from a fantasy perspective. That Gavin Williams is in the conversation with Ricky Tiedemann and Andrew Painter and you know Grayson Rodriguez is going to graduate here shortly. So it's like that tier isn't going to be unanimous anymore. And mm-hmm. it's going to be maybe it's you're a Tiedemann guy. Maybe you're a Yuri guy. Maybe you're a Gavin Williams guy. Uh, that is where he belongs. So anything long term goes to Gavin. Can't wait to see Gavin Williams. Hopefully at some point this year, or if not very, very soon. Yeah. Uh, Let's go to the next part of the show. Talk about notable promotions really quickly. And Welsh did touch on it. The big dog here, Yuri Perez, who as of this recording is going to be pitching just in a couple hours here going against Golden Graham Ashcraft and the Cincinnati Reds. Uh, So it'll be very exciting to see what Yuri Perez does in his debut. And like Welsh said, barring him getting completely blown up, uh, I would imagine he's going to probably stick around for a little while. So uh, he's definitely somebody, if he's out there in some league that you're playing in, you got to pick him up. Casey Schmidt, for the San Francisco Giants has been looking really good. And Luis Ortiz, even though he hasn't flashed yet for the Pittsburgh Pirates, he did debut and should be part of that team going forward. Let's go talk about prospect watch. Players that we are watching in the lower levels of the minor leagues that maybe uh, you can start getting on your radar here. And Welsh Dalton rushing of the Los Angeles Dodgers catching prospect here, just in uh, 22 years of age at high A ball. Seven bombs, a 284 batting average with a 322 ISO, 25% walk rate in 124 plate appearances. That will play. Um, so Dalton rushing, obviously with Will Smith there, I'm assuming that they're going to eventually maybe talk about him playing different positions maybe. Uh, what are your thoughts about Dalton rushings? Yeah, when Vinny was talking earlier about the guys in that system who might really have double plus power, the only thing that was missed because I agreed with what he said is you got to add Dalton rushing in there because Dalton rushing is the real deal. He had probably the most prolific uh, MLB draft pro debut last year where it, coming out of Louisville, he hit eight homers in just a handful of games and click back over. It was eight homers in... Uh, tw- 28 games in a ball last year, 424 batting average, still a base under 20% K percentage of 354 ISO. Okay, cool. That's fun. College bat coming in, playing a ball. Well, now he's pushed to high a, 
and he's doing it again. His average is a little bit lower, hitting 289, strikeout percentage a little bit higher, 23%. The walk percentage has gone up. He still has a 300 ISO. He is a cannonball of power that he can explode on baseballs. He has a six game hit streak going on right now. I believe it's 10 of the last 12 games he's had hits four straight multi-hit games he's coming off of right now. And over this past week, he's got four home or three homers, two coming from May 9th and May 10th. I mean, he has a great offensive plate presence. I don't know defensively, you know, you talk about Will Smith. They, all got, they also have Diego Cartaya, who Cartaya I've seen play in the outfield before. At the end of the day, if they lock up Will Smith, you know, it's, it's long enough and it's committed enough. This might be something where, you know, uh, Dalton rushing, moves off and maybe plays a third or is the secondary catcher and playing another position. And Diego Cartaya is playing in the outfield. They've got a glut of these guys, but Dalton rushing is one of my favorite from the draft class. It's great plate presence. He isn't a huge, huge issue as far as like getting on base because he strikes out and doesn't walk or anything like that. And uh, I think it's some of the biggest power in that system overall. And he's now clicked into it two straight years. It's only a matter of time before he's going to be pushed up to double a, they do have an issue though, where it's like they have to manage all these guys. They're not going to put rushing and Cartai on the same team. So they'll push up and you'll see Cart you'll see rushing come to double A at some point this year. And I think, you know, I've already got him pretty aggressively high, but if he continues this high A run and he pushes it over to double A, Dalton Rushing is going to be seen as a top. I don't know, 30 prospect, I think pretty easily. Cause I think he's going to push 25 homers this year. It's a huge, huge offensive bat. And I'm very, very excited about him. Now this is obviously very future thinking. And this is just obviously me guess, but like, is he somebody that the Dodgers would eventually with Will Smith, obviously catching at the major league level, would they look to have him play multi positions? Would they look to move Will Smith once he's closer to the big leagues? Do you have a, a guess Welsh? at how the Dodgers might view him in terms of when he gets up to that point? All of it's a possibility. Um, I think teams are valuing uh, two catchers more than ever before. So like not being the starting catcher isn't like the worst thing in the world. You know, Travis Darno, Sean Murphy situation. The Dodgers though also love to move guys around and like to play around with positions. Uh, it's just too early to tell because I think Diego Cartaya is going to get that pretty soon where he's going to like, they're going to do the, the Henry Davis, like he'll play in right field and he'll play oh, yeah, over yeah. here and they'll move that around. So I think it's a possibility catchers. You see the, like the two the well, three prime positions you'll see catchers move around for is right field, third base and first base. Those are like the three main places. The arm usually works with a catcher going to third base. I could see rushing, maybe going there if they're athletic enough. Uh, sometimes you'll see them go play second base. So that's a possibility. I don't know if he's quite that because, like I said, he's just like a big, thick bowling ball dude. So I would say third base or right field would be the possibility. But I don't care about those things. I don't worry about like, oh, they got mm -hmm. the major guy here or there. The Dodgers could use him as trade bait. Uh, he would bring back a huge haul if they were to make a blockbuster trade. I love the bat. And I've grown catchers have grown on me even more. I know it's kind of weird, like oh, catchers, they don't get the playing time. They just do now. And his bat's the type of bat you want to keep in the lineup. So big, big, big on Dalton rushing. I'm pumped for Dalton rushing now. I'll definitely be keeping an eye on him and what he's going to be doing uh, as he goes, rises up through the ranks in the Dodgers system. Uh, our next player is a player that's been on the show a couple times in the past. And uh, Adele Amador of the Colorado Rockies shortstop prospect um, right now, Ezekiel Tovar, obviously there, but this is a guy that is extremely talented in high a ball and three home runs, seven stolen bases, a three Oh two batting average right now, only an 11.6% K rate granted in only 19 plate appearances here, Vinny, but Amador seems like he could be the next great shortstop here for this Colorado Rockies team. And again, I remember him coming up on a few shows last year. So uh, he's continuing just how great he was last season. Yeah. Amador. I went back before this and watched a few of his games from last year just to see how he's progressed. I've come to the conclusion. I don't think we've seen the best of Amador yet. And I know that's weird to say, cause he had a really good low a last year in Fresno. I still don't think we've seen the pinnacle of Adele Amador. We're seeing this year he's being, you know, more selective with the pitches. He's, you know, he's being more selective at the plate. His K rate's down. 
his ISO is, you know, it's very small right now. You know, not only a 19 plate appearance, you know, sample size, but we're looking at three home runs already with seven stolen bases. Like we're looking at a tick up in power. And I think we're seeing more speed than I think was projected with Amandor. Like we can, if there's one thing we can count on, we can count on him having a decent average. He's very good with, you know, putting up consistent hard contact. But like I said, if this if this power uptick is real and with the speed, we're looking at someone who can fit, literally play a premium position. We're looking at a good average. We're looking at, you know, probably 15 to 20 homers and, you know, steals at the next level with the bigger bases with him too. Like we're looking at someone who can be plus hit, you know, 50, uh, 50 power and maybe 50 speed. And, and you put that in Colorado too, that's going to – it's going to boost his, you know, his power numbers too. Like I said, I think Amador is still pretty slept on right now. I remember uh, before the season started, me and Ross Jensen had a little chat on Twitter about players who potentially could end up being a, you know, number one overall in baseball prospect. I think if Amador takes another step this year, he's easily considered a top 20 prospect, if not a top, you know, 10. So, like I said, go get Amandor. I think he's, you know, he's cooled off a lot since last season. But if he keeps this hot start for most of the season, he's going to be a very, very hot name. Yeah, I mean, right now they're ranking him in most of these uh, places where you can read just prospect rankings. He's usually about number two behind Zach Veen. So, um, very, very much getting high promise, high praise uh, in their prospect system and somebody that I'm sure will be making this show a lot more going forward. Last player in this section, Carlos Jorge of the Cincinnati Reds. A shocker, another great infield prospect for that team. 19 years of age right now in A-ball, 108 plate appearances, three home runs, eight RBIs, and eight steals with a 326 average so far this season. 11.1% walk rate is very nice. It, uh, Mike, Carlos Jorge is a name I don't think we've talked about too much on this show, but he again, he's plays on a team with at a position where there's a lot of great players uh, for the Cincinnati Reds. So talk to us about Carlos Jorge and just a little bit of, about his background. Yeah, this is a guy I've mentioned on the show, I think maybe even twice. He was on the sleepers list I did several months back uh, and he's doing what he's been doing his whole career. So I thought it was a good time to bring him up again. You know, first thing I should mention is he has some of the biggest changes in scouting grades that I've ever seen from one year. Last year, he had a plus hit tool, plus speed with 35 grade power, which I completely disagreed with. Now he's listed with an average hit tool, which I think is too harsh, a plus game power, which might even be too much, and below average speed, which I think is too harsh on him. So to me, this is a guy with like above average hit tool, above average power, and plus speed. And at second base, that's that's a great player. That's a good prospect to me. Um what I should mention is he's had a 151 WRC plus in the DSL complex league and a ball or higher. So he's always been productive. He's always shown a, a good ability to steal bases defensively. He's played exclusively at second base. He was signed as a shortstop, but I think that's his home. I think he has enough, uh, enough athleticism to move to like center field. If he needs to down the road, the, the issue with him was his K rate rose from 17% to 26% between the DSL and complex league. And that's where I think the the plus hit tool down to average hit tool came from, but he's, he's started to lower that down a little bit, even in able that, that move from the complex league to a ball is a big move. It doesn't seem like a lot, but it's, it's, it's telling about a player and the, the fact that he's showing the same skill set, making that move right now to me is very promising for his future. Uh, he's just another one of those kids that's transformed his body since signing. He looks very strong and wiry. I mean, he's still like skinny, but, when you see a picture of him when he signed versus today, you can tell he's put in a lot of the work. I think he's going to be like a flashy, speedy, just exciting type player. Ultimately, I think his future will be determined by where the hit tool falls. The power looks good to me and the speed looks legit. So I'm, I'm very high on him long term, especially if he keeps playing the way he's been playing his whole career. All right, Carlos Jorge, make sure you keep an eye on him. Let's go to our last segment of the night, which is our who's next. This is us calling our shot to by next show. We'll have debuted in the big leagues. 
And Welsh, you are doubling down on CES. This is the week he gets the call to the big leagues for the Cincinnati Reds. I've been pretty ridiculous about it, but like it's it, at this point, I'm like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. Like, this is the guy. This is the the Reds could probably use some more bats. They could use some more uh, uh, more offense in the middle of their order. I don't know what else he can do. It, it's an absurd. I mean, 74 plate appearances. Look at that. Eight home runs. It's like under 20 games, 17 RBI. The guy the guy missed like the first three weeks of the season and he's already putting up leaderboard type of stats. He's a couple homers away from leading the entire minor and he's three weeks behind. So he's got a higher strikeout rate, though it's been lower here. He's a kind of swing and miss guy. I don't know what else he can do. He is he's offensively ready. Defensively, he's a little bit raw, but you got a DH spot. You know, Will, My- Will Myers going to keep you? It's ridiculous. Like Christian Encarnacion Strand is up by the next time you guys do this show. Guaranteed. All right. Guaranteed like or it. David Mendelson will do a personal 30-minute workout with you on, <laughs> on, a, on Zoom. I guarantee it. Oh, now the pressure's on. I don't want to do that. So hopefully, <laughs> hopefully see yes, you get the call and we don't have to do that. Uh, all right. This player here, Vinny Blake Walston of the Arizona Diamondbacks. You think he's going to get the call. He's a lefty uh, for them right now in double a uh, I'm going to ask the Welsh after this, his thoughts about this as well, but go ahead, Vinny. Yeah. Walston, uh, he's having arguably one of his best seasons he's had in professional baseball. Like we're looking at his left on base percentage is at a career high. We're looking at, you know, he hasn't given up a home run in what 34 innings, which with Blake Walston, if you follow him, no, is pretty astonishing. You know, uh, the real only concerning thing is that his K nine is really down, but I think they're working with him on either his command or something, because this is not like Blake Walston. But if you're looking at Arizona right now, they are trying every one of their pitching prospects they need an arm to you know come up and stick like i said i wouldn't be surprised if they gave you know walston a shot coming up you know in the next you know week or two here but yeah if we're talking about a consistent you know left-handed pitcher with you know back into the rotation kind of upside maybe a little bit more if he sticks blake walston's your guy like we've seen him you know, rack up strike numbers before. So this is not really that much of a concern, but yeah, he's definitely a guy to keep some tabs on to watch moving forward. Do you Welsh? I mean, obviously you, that's just your squad and you watch a lot of diamondbacks. Do you think he could potentially debut? It's definitely a possibility. You know, I hadn't given a lot of thought to Blake Walston, um, but you know, they've kind of exhausted everybody. Like when you said, like, there's nobody else. like Brandon fought was like the last bastion of what they could do. I don't know if they would throw Walston even, I mean, he easily could throw back into a rotation spot, but this would be a great arm in the bullpen. I would probably, I'd love to go back and look at some of the savant numbers in his triple a appearances to see what's going on. Because we've talked, uh, me and, Eno have talked a lot about how, you know, the stuff plus has kind of altered for a lot of guys, um, you know, fastballs and stuff like that at higher elevations. It just kind of kills some of the balls. So, you know, higher walk numbers, not bigger strikeout numbers aren't necessarily indicative of like who he is because he is putting up pretty great numbers, though an alarming like 236 ERA, a 698 XFIP. So there's a lot of luck factor in there as well, but they ain't got nobody else and they are trying everything. So, you know what? I hadn't given a lot of thought. I do think Walston definitely is someone to keep an eye on as you know henry and nelson and fought are all just kind of okay all right now i'm going to keep an eye on him as well mike i I, it would have been perfect if this show was a couple days ago (laughs) yuri perez is is gonna get the call here mike guess what you're right you you nailed it (laughs) wow you're right before the next episode yeah we we should be calling you the time traveler uh yeah, there's not much to say about Yuri Perez. I mean, we said a ton about him already, but if you would like to add on, this seems like going to be the pitching god right now because he's the one everybody's excited about right now for uh, in, in Major League Baseball and obviously in the minor leagues too. Yeah, uh, yeah. Since he since he's debuting today, I thought it would be a good time to go over him. If, could you throw the stats back up? On oh yes, I can. Um, so he's he's obviously well known, but like let's break it down here. He he's got a double plus fastball plus slider plus change average curve with double plus command. I don't think I've seen anything like that scouting grades wise for pitching other than Grayson Rodriguez in the last three or four or five years. So the, the, so he's a unicorn in that sense. 
Uh, a Yuri corn. A Yuri corn, yeah. So for those keeping score, that's that's three plus pitches with elite command. Uh, you know, for his size and like dominance throughout his minor league career, he's just been phenomenal. This, uh, I believe, he's the fourth youngest pitcher ever to debut, and the other three are kind of like Hall of Fame type level guys. Uh, so I will throw a little bit of cold water on this because I do think he's going to be clearly the biggest fab bid of the week, and he probably should be, but. He's never pitched above 78 innings in a season. The Marlins aren't particularly good. So the run support and wins might be hard to come by. I'm not sure that he's going to stay on the team all year. I do think he's good enough in unicornish enough to be effective in the time he's there. And I'm not, I'm not telling people to not bid on him, but just keep your expectations in check. I don't think this is necessarily a guy who's ready to just jump in and be a savior for your, for your team. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Long term, he's one of my favorite pitching prospects has been since he started when he was like 18, basically, because the whole time he's stood out, like his age versus level, especially for a pitcher, has been phenomenal. So this is one of my favorite guys. I just wanted to let you know that his redraft stock might not be what you're hoping right out the gate. How big of a leash would you give him in a redraft league, Vinny? If you obviously if you don't have to spend a ton of fab on him and you can use waivers. Would you give him a couple of starts before you cut him or would you, what are your thoughts about it? Oh, are you asking me or Vinny? Did I say Vinny? I meant Mike. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I definitely think if, especially if you don't have to spend $400 or fab on them or something, I don't, if it's just like a pickup off of free agents, I definitely think you should add him to the team and give him a little leash. I probably wouldn't cut him until, unless he was just getting destroyed or got sent back down, it would just kind of play itself out. I, I actually think he will be relatively effective. I just don't think it's going to extend throughout the whole season. Okay, fair enough. I'm, I'm excited to watch him pitch too. So it's going to be, uh, this will upload and uh, we'll get to watch Yuri Perez in the same day. I don't know if you can beat that combination. Uh, but that's going to wrap us up for the show. Welsh, thank you so much for hopping on and doing the prospect show with us. The call, we love doing this every single week and having someone like you on the show is always a treat for us. Can you please plug all the great work you're doing right now. Cause it is a lot. And yeah, I want to make sure everybody can checks it out <laughs> and wherever they want to go look at it, all the places they need to go. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to do that cause that'll be a lot, but just, uh, <laughs> the Twitter handled, uh, is it the Welsh? I put up like a article. Uh, funny enough. I put up an article on the athletic, um, breaking down some prospects and Yuri Perez was the headliner. I did it the morning before he got called up. So I looked, uh, I looked very smart uh, unintentionally. <laughs> Uh, on that one. So I got an article up on the athletic. If you want to check out, I'm on fantasy pros five days a week on the YouTube channel, uh, rates and barrels once a week, CBS. I missed this week, but, uh, I think I'll be on twice next week. You just it, the Twitter handles like the best place to see all the shows. I have my own content prospect one in this league. Uh, but I tweet out all the stuff. You can follow me there and, uh, got a Patreon with my prospect list in this league.com. That's the stuff, the man, the myth, the legend he is the welsh make sure you guys are checking out his twitter so all his work and all the great stuff he does in the fantasy baseball community but for the welsh for mike for Vinny, um david we're going to catch you guys next week on the call -up.